have a very special guest for you today. We're here at the studios of Dayton's premier visual artist, Ronnie Williams. Let's go inside. Our guest today is one of Dayton's premier visual artists. You've probably seen his art all over Dayton. He's one of the state of Ohio's premier visual artists, and we're very happy to have him on Minority Entrepreneur Showcase, Mr. Ronnie Williams. Oh, thank you. I'm glad to be on your show. Okay. Now, uh, first thing I wanted to ask, you are a Daytonian, right? That's correct. Okay. What part of Dayton did you come up in? I originally came up in the Edgemont area. I was a uh, student at Dunbar High School, uh, which is uh, the place where I discovered a lot of the, the work that I do. Okay, and uh, I understand you were a child prodigy as well. Yes, my uh, my parents didn't know it at the time, and there just happened to be uh, happened to have a couple of brothers who were into the arts, and uh, I pretty much followed behind them in pursuing this idea of, of art. Uh, and there were other people uh, in the schools that uh, discovered that I had talents that were far beyond my years. Mm -hmm. well, how do you, it, 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 I guess it's something you just, the type of talent you have is something you just born with or did you try to develop it in any kind of way when you were young or it just came out of you? Uh, that's something that I've just recently uh, uh, wondered about uh, uh, with my work. Um, I look at some of the things that I do and I, I would think that uh, some of those skills must have been there when I was born, but at the same time I realize it took uh, this long life that I've lived so far in order to accumulate the experiences uh, that brings my work to where it is today. So I don't know whether it's nature or nurture. Uh, if it's uh, more because of the practice uh, of the work that has brought me to where I am, or uh, if I had those skills and talents from the very beginning. Uh, it's probably a mixture of it in some way. Now who were your uh, inspirations coming up? I mean, who, who, did you, who did you look at? Well, I'm in your early adult years, I would say. Um, for black artists, there weren't many uh, examples that I could go by er, in, in my early years. I always thought that art was the, the, the purview of only white people. Only white people uh, had the luxury to be able to do this thing called art until later on in my life when I met uh, Bing Davis, Willis Bing Davis, uh, um, who I got to know as a man and as a person, uh, and I got to know his family, and I realized that a, a person can very well have a family and a, a normal life and be an artist as well. And he was the first example that I had uh, that I could live, how I could live as an artist. Not just do my art, but how do I do my life with this thing called art? And then later on, there were specific examples that uh, had a lot to do with the direction of my work. Uh, I was, um, uh, I wasn't, cat I didn't categorize myself earlier on because I didn't know how to. I didn't understand uh, abstract art or impressionism or or uh, realism or, or surrealism uh, until I met an artist. Uh, I met his work. His name is John Leon Jerome. I met his work and it impacts me today. I'd never seen anybody that uh, portrayed reality in the way that this artist did. It wasn't uh, that he was uh, like photo, a photorealist, uh, painting things in an idyllic kind of way. Uh, he seemed to to bring uh, reality uh, to life on the canvas. And I'd often hoped that someday, if I had half the ability to do that as this man did, then I will have achieved everything that I wanted to in, in, in life or in my art. Because your art to me speaks of realism. I guess you mm -hmm. could call it realistic art. Mm -hmm. That's a category that 
to put it in. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't uh, because there's also a category that's very close to that. It's called photorealism. Okay. And uh, so photorealism uh, is pretty much as it says, uh, it, it, you can make the, your subject matter look as though there was a photo taken of it. Well, I don't, I'm hoping not to be a photorealist uh, because I want you to see what I feel in the art. That's what I want to bring out, the story that I'm telling. I want you to feel what it is I felt, if it happened to be joy or if it happened to be something, have something to do with it, an angry scene. I would want you to be able to feel that. And so uh, a photo realist would try to reproduce reality just like as he sees. Mm -hmm. And the job is done at that point with a photorealist. But someone like myself is hoping to be able to touch the viewer uh, in as realistic way as I possibly can. You, you, have, you have one piece that I saw uh, up at uh, Black Arts Plus as a matter of fact. And the piece really, really struck me. And that was the piece where you had uh, the chess pieces. And there was a hand coming out of the sky, like the hand of Big Brother there, and the White House uh, in the background. From what you were saying just a minute ago, how you want people to see things out of your art, that piece really struck me because I saw so much symbolism that uh, uh, that I, I think is is a good example of what I was hoping to do uh, in terms of uh, differentiating myself from photorealism and a realism that uh, expresses the way that I feel and I think uh, that that piece which I called confrontation I, I played on the word called uh, the, the word confrontations and call it confrontations. Uh, I, I always everyone thinks of pawns as uh, something that is manipulated by the player, and so I made that idea literal when I brought the hand down in order to show how these particular moves are, have been manipulated. I've got the white pawn placed on the black square and the black pawn placed on the white square. Well, they're confronting. Uh, one another as to their particular positions, but the point I was making is that they were not the ones who and were responsible for where they mentioned stood. For uh, I have uh, symbols of buildings in Washington uh, to suggest that that is where this game is and has been played. Uh, so again, I just was trying to um, to show us, hopefully, uh, to get us to feel that perhaps we are not the ones that uh, are all the time uh, responsible for our situation. Mm -hmm. Now you have, as I mentioned at the uh, top of the show, you have art all over the city of Dayton, mm -hmm. and people pass by your work and don't even don't know who the genius was behind what they see. They just know they like what they see. Mm -hmm. uh, now I understand that you have uh, a mural in the courthouse in Sydney, Ohio. Recently, in a few months ago, I was commissioned uh, along with uh, uh, 60 other artists and uh, those numbers were uh, pared down to a uh, final three. There was uh, a company in uh, Los Angeles, California and a company uh, in New York City and uh, me. I was the third choice that they made. and. Um, the whole idea was uh, expressing uh, uh, some of the experiences of the Civil War because this bit in uh, Sydney mm -hmm. housed many of uh, Union soldiers who uh, traveled from the north on their way through Dayton, Ohio and towards the south in order to do some fighting in the south. And many of them stayed there in that building. That building was there. So uh, recently the building was restored. Uh, the judge who was uh, the, the judge uh, in that, uh, that courthouse today uh, and a committee, a steering committee there in Sydney, Ohio, uh, after looking at my work, thought they wanted some of my work represented there in the courthouse. and. Uh, and um, 
they all seemed to love the mural and I'm glad that I had a chance to do the work. But one of the reasons that I was chose to do it is because of the judge there. He's a, a man with character and he wanted uh, the experience of African Americans to be portrayed in his courthouse because he realized that would be more realistic about what was going on in the Civil War. It was around uh, black folks and it also included black men and he wanted that to be included there and he saw my work and thought I was the ideal person to do the job and I and I hope I did the courthouse and um, black people uh, a, a service by the work that I did. There's a piece sitting right here in front of me that I think is really great and a really unique piece and, and it says a lot as to what's really going on uh, right now with a lot of people. We have a lot of homeless folks. We got folks out there. And this piece really says a lot. I'm really glad that you uh, mentioned this piece. Uh, uh, this piece was uh, my making a statement about uh, the whole idea of, of greed and, and people wanting more than they deserve. And I and I use this street as, a, as an opportunity opportunity through symbolism to make uh, uh, symbolic statements about uh, the whole idea of, of greed. Uh, I called it yield on greed. Uh, I, I first did that by taking the end off the word green, which which we would probably see a sign that says yield on green, and uh, somebody with their with their graffiti fingers put the D there, and some more graffiti on the back of the sign t uh, talks about uh, someone wanting more. Uh, just con a continuation of s symbols representing the idea of greed on the license plates on the cars. Uh, one says uh, me first and, uh, and the other one uh, talks about moving over. There's a bank there, uh, a bingo hall behind. It's a great big fat guy and a friend of his standing in front of a bank eating, uh, gouging themselves, uh, overdoing it, getting greedy. On the steering wheel on the car uh, going by, the lady, the person shows diamonds on their, their fingers. Uh, the color of the car is the color of money. Uh, the lights, if you notice, the street lights are green in all directions. And uh, this took place on a street called Wealthy Way in 2004. Um, I also showed uh, people in their guilt throwing coins down at the feet uh, of a bum. But this supposed bum has an expression on his face that he is as full of joy as any of all of these greedy people around him. Uh, he is holding a sign uh, which is a, a Bible verse uh, saying Luke 23 and 34. It was uh, the, the verse where Jesus said to his father while he was on the cross, Lord forgive them for they know not what they do. This bum used that verse to say for himself, forgive all of these greedy people around him for they know not what they do. And and by the way, this piece was a uh, 2003 uh, People's Choice Award at the Ohio State Fair. Uh, the, the piece that wins the People's Choice Award, um, the, the painting hung in the governor's office for uh, all of the year in 2003 to 2004. That, that takes me into what my next question was going to okay. be about which is in 2003 you won an award at the Ohio State Fair. Yes, this was the this was the piece. This was one of the the pieces as a matter of fact. Okay. I won the first place, I won second place, and I won the People's Choice Award. So that was three okay. awards that I won at that competition. And that was the first time I'd ever entered the Ohio State Fair. Okay. And it was uh it was a it was a confirmation for me to enter that professional competition and and do so well. Um, it says some things to me about uh, you did a, the state you did a of fantastic well. job Thank with you. that because that picture says an awful lot, and to call it greed, yeah. I mean that that just speaks for itself because we tend to li we live in a culture that's pretty much like yes, that. Yes, yes, and I had been told uh, that uh, some people not only some people love the piece, and some people uh, had 
was angry about the piece. It, it angered some people. Mm. Yeah, because I, I was thinking because the piece spoke directly to their hearts. Hearts, yeah. Now, uh, you also received uh, awards in 1996 and 1997 at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. Well, yeah, that those experiences were to, to that point in my career were the, 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 the biggest experiences I've had uh, there because I found that uh, it's called the Black Creativity Art Show and that art show uh, was uh, supposed to be a collection of professional black artists all over the United States and some abroad. And for me to win that uh, two consecutive years, mm -hmm. the best of show, uh, to compete with all professional black artists in and outside of the country and come out uh, 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 on top, uh, again, was another statement uh, that, that confirmed for me that I should continue to do the work that I do. and that. It's not only me who thinks so. Mm -hmm. And in July of 97, you also got the uh, Indiana Black Expo. Yes, that was another experience, some uh, similar to uh, the Black Creativity Show in Chicago. The Indiana Black Expo at that time had uh, what was called the best of the best show. Uh, and that was in 1999. And it was a collection of the, all of the artists who had won first prizes there at the Indiana Black Expo for 10 years before that date. And when I won that award, it was called the best of the best award. And that meant that uh, out of all of the winners, who were the only ones that were allowed to be in the show were ones who had won previously, that um, they thought I, that I was the best of the best. So I accepted. <laughs> well, I can, I can attest to that from mm -hmm. what I see, I think mm -hmm. you really are. Well, thanks. I mean, you, you, you're about the best that I've seen. Uh, Ronnie, now, you, you've also uh, been an instructor of art, and I think you've had, uh, you, you've taught in the school system, and you yes. have private students also, too, right? Yes, that's great. Yeah. I taught there at Green Academy uh, for the for Dayton Public Schools, had uh, uh, kids from uh, 11 through 16-year-old high school kids uh, that was, uh, it was a challenging experience with, with the children, trying to not only to teach them art, but uh, to give them some feel of, of what art was about. And that's as much as I thought I'd be able to do with them. Most of the kids in the class were just there uh, as an elective uh, course uh, in order to get credits. Mm -hmm. There were few who were there because they truly wanted to, to do art and learn about art. But you have private students also too, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, lately in the last couple of years I've uh, had the opportunity of uh, sharing uh, some of my skills with uh, some adults. Uh, they come here to the, uh, the house and uh, we, uh, uh, we work about uh, twice a week and actually it's, it's a painting course because um, uh, we're not dealing with uh, other aspects of art. They want to learn to paint mm -hmm. and uh, so I'm pretty much focusing on, on, on just that. Yeah. Okay. Now, one thing we didn't talk about that would probably be of interest to people uh, out there in the viewing audience, especially young folks who are artists and want to make a career out of being an artist. What about the business aspect of being an artist? Wow, that's 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 uh, that's one. Of, it's not only a, a difficult question; uh, it's it's a necessary question that any uh, one who uh, is considering pursuing art professionally is going to have to ask him or herself uh, are they willing firstly to to endure the sacrifices that this vocation can take them through mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons is because uh, the, the, the society itself uh, is not geared toward uh, the life uh, of an artist. You must see the world in a different way 
than others in the world. If you can imagine uh, walking past a tree, uh, most people will ask them, will say to themselves, that is a beautiful tree. Well, an artist is demanded not only to see the tree, but he has to ask himself, what does the other side of the tree look like? even though he can't see it hmm. and 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 so you must go beyond oh, what you think you see so in terms of making a living you must go beyond what you think you see and uh, one of the things you will have to sacrifice is uh, perhaps relationships with others uh, if you're going to be dedicated and a serious artist it may mean uh, ostracism uh, of most of the people that are around you Our is a vocation that you do solely by yourself. There's no one but you and the canvas. That no one needs to be there doing that work but you too. And uh, many times your life will pan out that way. At least that's the way mine has gone. You know, it seems that it's a very difficult road. For example, being a musician. To be a musician, one is on the road a lot. Maybe if you get to go get that far into it, and it's hard to establish relationships. Jobs don't come easy. Club owners don't want to pay you any money, you know. And then uh, if you want to be an actor, they go through all kind of stuff to try to break into that, going to auditions and living in their cars. And so it seems like the artistic world demands a certain amount of sacrifice and you you said uh, the kind of sacrifices that, that I, I, I mentioned are one must ask one's self are they willing to endure the, all of these things. all of these things in order to to bring joy to to the world because at least for me and most artists I know the the motivation the bottom line motivation for doing art is to bring some additional beauty to the world to create something that's never been seen before to somehow uplift uh, the the viewer of of one's work mm -hmm. to show hopefully uh, some deeper thought in some way that others have never thought about it before as opposed to doing something destructive to tear down something to harm someone in life the vocation of an artist is to bring something positive to the world and yet that same world many times don't appreciate the arts like it should mm -hmm. I feel a responsibility to myself initially but secondly I feel responsible to show the world uh, to bring to the world the importance and the value of this thing called art because I, I, I recently thought that there's not one building not one church not one home anywhere in this country that doesn't have uh, some artwork on its walls somewhere everyone uh, dread adorns their walls with art and it even goes back in history with ancient artists drawing on cave walls and what have you mm -hmm. it's been a part of our lives as long as as there has been the, the human race okay. so we need to continue with it I'm going to stay on this business aspect for a moment uh, because uh, for a lot of young folks like uh, they want to be a basketball player, but they don't know all the things that it takes to become this successful basketball player. They want to be a rap artist, you know, and and they see themselves becoming instant successes at, at being a, uh, a rap artist. Now, putting on uh, art shows, you know, and I would imagine a young artist would see their uh, have visions of seeing their art up in some art gallery mm -hmm. somewhere and, and the way things are nowadays with TV and see themselves making all this bling bling mm -hmm. and all of that kind of stuff. For uh, someone that's in that kind of mindset, mm -hmm. what would you say to them? Well, uh, firstly, if you're thinking about bling bling and you're thinking about money, you wouldn't choose art in the first place. <laughs> you would you would do something else that's going to bring you money. So this is something that you you got to you got to love it in order to be willing to sacrifice for it. Uh, what I did is probably not typical of what I've heard others do and and others say about how to make money with this art. 
what I did, and I'm not suggesting this for anybody else because I, I, I you know, I, it depends on who the person is. I believed very early in myself. That's what I did to make the money, mm -hmm. ultimately. Okay. I believed very early, one might say naively so, but as I've lived, I, and each day that I succeed, it confirms for me that uh, I did make the right choice. I didn't know it at the time. Mm -hmm. I did what I felt was right. And when I say that I believed in myself, what I believed was just do the thing I do as best as I can. And, and not only be satisfied with that, do it even better than most others. And a byproduct of that is money, a sense of, of comfort. Uh, you can buy most of the things that you need in life. That's all I asked for. But I had no dollar figure in mind. I had a belief, again, that if you do the best you can with what you want to do, that people will pay you for it. Now, you know, what you're saying there, I believe, is good advice. And I think it carries over into any career path that a person might choose. Number one, they do need to believe in themselves. Mm -hmm. And number two, they should strive to be the absolute best that they can be mm -hmm. at whatever it is that they're getting into. Mm -hmm. And I think that's dynamic advice for anyone. Yeah, but I, I started that in a world of, let's say, 1965, 1970. Yeah. That's the kind of world that allowed me to think that. If I were starting over today, beginning my career today, I don't know. I'll be honest, I don't know if I would have approached it the same way I did some 30 years, years ago. Right, right. The whole atmosphere was different. Was different. Where, where I could say, I can believe in myself right. and so that's going to carry me through. Because we were propagating that to one another at that time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, what, that's what it, it was I, black power. I came, I, I came out of a, a, an atmosphere of right. that. Believe exactly. In it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, Please. Ronnie Williams, it's been a pleasure doing this interview with you. You know, you're a very uh, dynamic man. I think you have a lot to offer. And your art speaks for itself. You know, there's nothing you have to say. All you have to do is show your work. And that says everything for you. Thank you. Why don't we go look at some of your work? Okay, we're now in the gallery room uh, uh, at Ronnie Williams Studio. Uh, Ronnie, you had some particular uh, artwork that you wanted us to look at. Uh, uh, that you wanted to point, talk about or uh, point out that was favorites of yours. Tell us about them. Yes. Well, this is one, one piece that I, I love. This piece is called Father's Day. Um, uh, what inspired this piece for me is uh, the way Mother's Day is always uh, and always has been celebrated very highly. Uh, but the idea of fathers uh, somehow uh, has always lacked something. So I wanted to show the kind of, uh, or, or relay the kind of, uh, a feeling of the kind of sadness that many fathers can have, uh, either losing families or people just simply not focusing on the idea of fathers and Father's Day. Um, you see how the piece of paper on the telephone pole to the upper right of the piece is torn in the shape of the state of Ohio. And down the pole, again, is uh, where I've decided to put the symbol of Africa in this piece. Okay, Ronnie, as, as a matter of fact, now that you mentioned Africa, I think Africa is a trademark in all of your works, isn't it? Somewhere in all of your works? Yes, yeah, some years ago I uh, uh, decided, uh, uh, I, I did a painting of a lynching scene and a piece of bark fell off of a tree. This was some 25 years ago. And uh, that void that the bark left uh, resembled the shape of the state of Africa, the continent of Africa. And uh, so after that, uh, people expressed that they'd like to see that again. 
and uh, some of my other works, and uh, I've been asked to uh, do that ever since. So now it appears in, in most pieces. And if it doesn't, it's probably because I, I've forgotten to put it there, <laughs> or something about the picture did not lend itself to that, that shape. Uh, so, uh, yes, it does, and I try to have it appear in just every, every piece that I do. Okay. Uh, the next piece here is My Gift to You. This piece, I wanted to say so many things. One was to focus on the idea of what's truly important in our lives. In this, in this, this scene, I have uh, the black family. I have, uh, I'm showing a situation where the, the wife or the woman is giving her man or her husband the most important gift that one could ever give to someone. And in this case, it is, it is the child. And he's looking at her, looking in her eyes with a sense of reverence as though they'll never part and this family will be forever. And the reason I have them uh, in African garb is because I wanted to uh, strip uh, as much of the conventional way of thinking away from us as I could. And that's why I use the African garb. And you might notice on her gown, there are little symbols of the, the continent uh, of Africa all over. The black dots are there to represent the people, and the green represents the land, and the red represents the blood of the people. And all of this is uh, displayed on her gown. The next piece um, I did to, to to show black business and how black entrepreneurship still exists today. Uh, I call that piece Sweet Grass. Uh, I was making a trip to uh, South Carolina, uh, Myrtle Beach, and on the way down, I happened to see on the side of the road uh, this little basket weaving kind of uh, get up on the side of the road uh, where this old black lady and black man were there working and I saw them as a potential painting from the very beginning. The moment I saw them, I, 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 I wanted to make a statement about the fact that black people have been a hard working business people for forever and that's what we've had to do and that's, that's what inspired me with that piece. This next piece is I call uh, it's about Africa, but it's about being able to see Africa no matter where you look. Uh, and it, I was inspired to do a winter and summer uh, seasons uh, piece. Uh, and I call them Visions Home 1 and Visions Home 2. And the Visions Home 2 here is the shows the scene of the, the calm and the green and the richness uh, of summertime and on the water where the lily pad pads float. It, one of them happened to float in the shape of the, of the continent of Africa again. But I did the piece because I simply wanted to see Africa in the summer and this is the way it came out. This one piece I did fairly recently uh, for a uh, an occasion in the Wright Dunbar area uh, around Paul Lawrence Dunbar's 100th, uh, the 100th anniversary of his death. And this uh, piece was, I was asked to do this piece uh, uh, for that occasion. Uh, the piece was uh, just recently in the um, Schuster Center downtown. Uh, and this coming weekend, it'll well, no, it won't be this week. Uh, this this month, it'll be in the Wright Dunbar area again at uh, another studio displayed uh, uh, next door to Bing Davis's uh, studio on uh, Martin Luther King Way. Um, one of the reasons I did this piece because I had never seen I'd seen lots of pieces of Paul Lawrence Dunbar photographs and what have you, just as I've seen the Martin Luther King. For some reason, many of the photographs or portraits or artwork I've seen of these important brothers didn't seem to capture a feeling of those personalities. So I attempted to capture Paul Lawrence Dunbar's personality. Uh, in this piece and, I, and I'm hoping I was able to do it. Uh, this one last piece I want to talk about is um, a piece I call 
uh, arose in winter. Uh, oh, back in 1989, I lived in Seattle, Washington, and Seattle, Washington is always a gloomy and fairly cold uh, kind of place. Uh, there's very little sunshine. And, uh, people brag and scream about sun breaks, uh, and that's seeing the sun for a short period of time. That's something people uh, 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 really got excited about. Uh, someone gave me a rose, and realizing that the rose wasn't going to live, I figured the only way that I could keep it is and keep it alive and keep the warmth that this rose gave me is to do a portrait of it. This is a portrait of a flower, and I call it Rose in Winter because. The rose I set in the window shield, seal, and it's set just in front of a frosty, cold uh, window, and there's hopefully the contrast of the warmth of the rose up against the coldness of the window uh, was what I was trying to, to make a statement about the beauty of contrast and the perfection of flowers and the warmth that the flower gave me. Many of my pieces uh, have to do with personal experiences that I've had and the ways that I see life. Most of the time about personal pieces, it doesn't matter to me at all who, what someone thinks of the piece when they see it, so long as it served my purposes. Uh, I'm the first one to be excited about seeing what a piece would look like after I've painted it. Uh, and sometimes, just for the sake of seeing what something would look like if I painted it, that's reason enough for me to do another work of art. So those are just a few other pieces I wanted to share uh, with you all. Ronnie, those were some fantastic pieces of art. And you are a very beautiful brother. You are a genius in the visual arts world. We want to thank you for what the gifts that you've given us here in Dayton. And we also want to thank you for coming on Minority Entrepreneur Showcase. Well, it's been my pleasure. It's my pleasure. And with that, again, you've been watching Minority Entrepreneur Showcase. I'm your host, Talani Mufaro-Gell, and we will see you.